we welcome you again tonight to another Bible prophecy. Amen. Amen. Let's see, we're going to make this work here tonight. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm glad to see everyone here. Praise the Lord. Amen. Tonight we have another wonderful prophecy we want to share with you. Um, we're just going to jump right in it. Um, there's a lot to share with you guys. And I was just telling Elder Green that, you know, I would like for you to, when you get extra time, you know, dig into this prophecies yourself, you know, because I'm just, I'm just barely touching, you know, just, just the top of it, you know, just a little bit of information because of, of the time that we have. Amen. So, um, but I pray that, I pray that you have been blessed and that you continue to be blessed as we continue, continue to dig into prophecies that the Lord has left for us. One thing about this prophecy is um, the seven seals, they reveal to us the religious history of the church, all, all the way from the time of Christ to the second coming. Amen? So not that the other prophecies are not important, but um, I would pay a little bit more attention to this prophecy because it's going to give us an idea, um, the condition the spiritual condition of the church uh, from the times of Christ to the second coming of Christ. Amen? Amen. Um, and, and as you can see, there's a lot of things that we're going to talk about tonight that we've already mentioned, okay? Um, because uh, everything has to pretty much do with Rome, okay? Amen. It has to do because that is where the church started, in that area, in that vicinity. Um, and that's where, you know, the, the, the major events and the major changes that were made in the church, were made there. Amen? So before we start, let's have another word of prayer. Father, we are so grateful, again, for you allowing us to be here in your presence and with your children, Lord. We, re we rejoice, Lord. We rejoice to be here and to hear your word. We ask again that you hide me behind the cross, that your children see and hear your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's begin. Let's, work, let's open the Word of God. As always, everything is up on the screen. All you have to do is follow along with me. And again, I want to remind you, when you see something that's highlighted with a different color, um, just kind of pay attention to that. Amen? Because it, it stands out for a reason. Okay? So let's, let's begin with the first seal. Amen? Revelation 6, 1 and 2 says, Now I saw when the lamp opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white what? A white horse, a white horse. He who sat on it had what? Had a bow. And what? And a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So, so here we have a few things. We have an individual on the horse. By the way, every horse has a rider. Amen? <laughs> but we have to kind of, you know, kind of let you know about that, right? So, so we have the rider. We have the individual on the horse. This is a white horse. The, the, the person uh, riding the horse has a, a, a bow, but on top of having a bow, a, a crown was given to him. He didn't have the crown. It was given, and, and this horse was conquering, amen? amen. So, so this, this white horse represents the first period of the history of the Christian church. Remember, we're talking about the periods of the church, and we're talking about the state of the church from Christ all the way to the second coming, amen? So this is the very beginning. This is when the church began. This is the church of the apostle. The church began approximately A.D. 31, right, in the times of Jesus. And, and, and we believe that this church began on the day of Pentecost, Right, And there's a lot of reasons to believe that because before the day of Pentecost, even the disciples were not sure about Jesus. Even the disciples didn't really understand the mission. But in the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the church because the church were the disciples. Amen? Amen. So upon that little group, right, that, that were the, the, the faithful followers of Christ, here comes the Holy Spirit and the church begins, right? This is what we call the apostolic church. Amen? Amen. So whiteness in the Bible always, say always, always, always represents purity. 
Okay, as we read in Psalms 51.7, this is the Psalm of David, the, 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 the Psalm of Repentance of David. Amen. He says in verse 7, wash me and I shall be whiter than what? Than snow. So, so for three years, my dear church, while the, the disciples were in the presence of Jesus, while the disciples were called by God to be apostles, amen, they were taught by Jesus himself. Amen. They weren't taught in, in any institution, in any college, a theology. They were taught by the master himself how to go and, and move the gospel. And because the gospel came right out of the mouth of Jesus, it was pure. Can we get an amen? Not only because it came out directly of the mouth of Jesus, but it, it was at its beginning. Amen. At its beginning, right? So, so the whiteness of the horse denotes the purity of the faith of the apostolic church. Amen? Amen. Yes, sir. Paul tells us in Colossians 1.23, not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature in heaven. Uh, under heaven. Amen. So, so during the first century, after Christ, the apostles carried the gospel to every outskirts of civilization in existence at that time. Amen. And, and this is, this is what, what the Bible says, the prophecy says, that, that, that the horse was conquering and to conquer. I mean, that's what it means, right? The, and, and this is very fittingly because it represents the conquest of the early Christian church in its purity. It came out of the mouth of Jesus. It had its beginning, and, and it, was, it was actually baptized and anointing by the Spirit of God. Amen? So, man, won't it be so nice if the church can, can come back to these days? But if, unfortunately, it, it's, it's not going to happen. Amen? So, so here we have the, 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 first, the first seal. The first seal has a horse. What color is the horse? White. The horse is white. And, and, and the first horse represents what? Huh? Purity. Re represents purity, but it also represents the first period, the first stage, right? The beginning of the Christian church. The beginning of, of the church of the apostles. Amen? So now... Uh, 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 some time has gone by, and now we got the second seal, Revelation 6, 3, and 4. It says, when he opened the second seal, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from earth. Mm. This is kind of like the opposite of what we just read, right? And it was... And, 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 and it was given the power to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So we have, again, we have an individual and the horse. The horse this time is red fury. Amen. It's, it's, it's a red color. And, and, and it was given the authority to remove peace. And because this horse removed the peace, the, pe the people would start killing each other, right? And on top of that, it says that it had a great sword. So, so under this symbol, something is represented that is not as pure as the first. Are you with me, church? Right? So this horse went forth to take peace from the earth and to kill, let me, read, let me share this with you from the Bible readings, page 248. As whiteness in the first horse donated the purity of the gospel, which its rider propagated, so the color of the second horse would show that corruption, that what? Corruption had begun to creep, hmm, to creep in when this symbol applies. It is true that such a state of things did succeed the apostolic church. So, so here we have the church. It was born, the Holy Spirit, right out of the mouth of Jesus, right? Of, uh, uh, a time goes by, and, and, and the corruption, according to, to the second seal, the corruption starts seeking in, it starts creeping inside the church. 
What is the corruption? The worldliness. So every time you try to take the worldliness into the church, this is going to happen. And we could talk so much about this, amen? So much. So, so the church sought alliance with the secular power. Hmm. It sought alliance with the secular power, and trouble and commotion were the results. Here's what James Worry, the historian, says. At the end of the second century, Christianity had begun already to wear the garb of atheism. Hmm. This is bad. <laughs> the seeds of most of those errors that afterwards so entirely overran the church marred its beauty and tarnished its glory were already taking roots. This is bad. This is bad, church. So, so during the second century, what century? The second century in the church established by the apostles, established by Jesus himself, the leaders also began to strive among themselves for power. Now, now it is okay if, if something comes from the outside and tries to creep in the church to corrupt the church. Right? We can understand that because the devil can come from the outside and try to ruin the church of God, right? The devil can try to come in here in MLK and ruin what God is trying to do. Are you with me? But the difference is when somebody inside the church is doing that. That's what, that's what it's saying here, right? And, and look, look at Paul. Oh, I love Paul. He was already sensing that something was not right. And this is Paul before the second seal was open. Are you with me, church? Here's what he says in Acts 20, 29. This, this is him, like, prophesizing, right? For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among who? Come on, help me, church. Look it up there. Among who? Among you, he is talking to the church right now. He is saying, I know that when I leave on my departure, obviously when he dies, right? Because he, he, he worked for Christ until, he de until his death, right? So this is what he's saying. When I'm not here no more, I know that savage wolves will, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. I, I, I got to say, Lord, have mercy on us. Yeah. Are you with me, church? <laughs> Savage wolf are going to come out from the church. Hmm. He, 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 he felt that. He sensed it, right? So, and then he says, also from among yourselves, men will rise up. He's still speaking to the church, y'all. Speaking perverse things. People in the church. To draw away the disciples after themselves. Do we, this, is, this is back in the time of Paul, after Paul. This is, this is the beginning of the second century. But we're still suffering that today. It's like when we started the seventh church of Ephesus, the seventh church of um, Revelation. Every single thing that happened to the church, every single thing is happening today. We got a whole series on, this, on the churches of Revelation. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to do that next year. So Paul is sensing something is not right. And there was a while after his death that the second century came, but he was already sensing it. So there was people already in the church, you know, but because why would you say something like that? Amen. Right? If, if you didn't see something happening. Hmm? And just as it was prophesied by Revelation, Paul said it and it happened. So even in Paul's days, the errors were creeping in. And by the second century, the church of Christ was so corrupted that the colors of the horse representing this period of the church is no longer white. What, what does it mean? It lost the purity. It's like it wasn't a virgin anymore. Are you with me, church? Right? Paul says that after his departure, no man of sin would arise and sit upon a throne and claim to be God. 
the system represented by this man of sin, Paul calls the mystery of lawlessness. Let, let's read um, Dr. W.D. Killing, the ancient church preference, page 15 and 16. Now, I have history documents sharing with you, because as I said before, I have no way of proving to you prophecy unless I go into history. There's, you can't prove prophecy without history, because history is going to say, okay, the Bible said this was going to happen, and history confirms it, right? So these are writers that, that are, are well-respected, and, and, and they write about actual history, right? It's like I say, so, so I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. We're Seventh-day Adventists, right? So if I bring you writings about Seventh-day Adventists, bam, 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 what's going to happen? People are going to kind of wonder, wait a minute, Pastor Perez has all this, all this history evidence, but they're all Adventist writers. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So, so, so these people have nothing to lose. Why? Because they're not Adventist writers, right? They're not Adventist writers, and they're proving prophecy to be real. Hallelujah. So, so, so here, here's what this gentleman says. Between the days of the apostles and the conversion of Constantine, the Christian commonwealth changed its aspect, rites and ceremonies, of which neither Paul nor Peter ever heard, crept silently into use, and then claimed the ranks of divine institution. Lord have mercy. So, so the second period in the history of the church begins about 100 A.D. and extends all the way to the time of Constantine in A.D. 323. This is the represented in the symbol by the great sword that was given to the rider of the red horse. When the principles held by the church are enforced by the sword of the state, then the church has truly received power to take peace from the earth. Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound something like the mark of the beast, y'all? Huh? Force worship, second century, and it's coming back again. Hmm? Hmm, Lord have mercy. All right, so we have the second seal. What was the second seal? Who can tell me real quick? The second seal. Hmm? The fire horse, and, and, and what happened? He gave authority to what? He took what out of the earth? He took the peace out, right? And because he took the peace out, people were killing each other, right? Okay, let's go to the third seal. Revelation 6, 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of what? scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. This is powerful. <laughs> so, so church, by the time the third seal opens, the church has become very corrupt. Very what? Very corrupt. How rapidly works of corruption progresses. Black is the opposite of white, right? Amen. So this seal opens about the time of Constantine, the pagan emperor of Rome, when he accepted Christianity. Now this is interesting. Go to Google, just find, just Google it, you're going to find it. Constantine, the Roman emperor, accepted Christianity, right? So when Constantine became... Okay, a Christian, then religion became very popular, and the heathen flocked to the churches. This is history. He becomes a Christian, and the moment that he becomes a Christian, the heathens, what they do? They flock the church, right? Under this third seal, the black horse, the church became black with apostasy and sin. It took up practices contrary to the law of God, practices which Jesus and the apostle had never thought and had never, um, would never accept. So, so the balance that he had in his hands of this rider of the black horse denote the union of the power of the church and the state under authority. That's what it means. The union between the power of the state and 
the church. The selling of the wheat and barley indicates that the love of money in this world with its pleasure would be prevalent in the church during this period. That's what that means. Now, the oil and wine represented the grace of the Spirit, faith and love, and God did not want the spirit of worldliness to destroy entirely the grace of genuine pity upon the earth. Amen. Why? Because even all this evilness that Satan is bringing on the church, God always had a group of people, hello, uh, what we call the remnants. The remnants have been around since Jesus. Okay? He always had a group of people to preserve the faith of of Jesus. Are you with me, church? Because Jesus was not up about to let this clown called the devil to destroy this world completely. Amen? So this is why the prophecy says to preserve the oil and the wine. Amen? So here's something interesting I want to share with you. Constantine had a lot to do with this period of darkness represented by the dark horse. I mean, a lot to do with it. So so, so, so when did Constantine convert it? Let me, uh, I got the information right here. Constantine converted to Christianity in 312 AD at the Battle of Milvian Bridge, where he fought against Western Emperor Maxentius to take his place on the throne. When he was victorious in this battle, he credited the Christian God with his victory. You can see God is with what? Lowercase. So he became a Christian. So let's, let's talk a little bit about his Christianity. What was Constantine's most important act regarding Christianity? Here we go, guys. You guys ready? Constantine's most important act regarding Christianity was calling an ecumenical council, specifically the Council of Nicaea, in 325 A.D., Look it up, y'all. This is so important. I'm just touching the top right now. This council was significant because it aimed to settle theological what? Theological dispute within Christianity and establish a uniform set of beliefs and practices for, practices for the Christian church. So he becomes a Christian and now... He's going to gather his people, and he's going to change the law of God. He's going to change the rules and get regulations, right? Because he wanted some kind of a uniformity. One of the things that he was doing, he was trying to appease the people. Because the Christianity was growing so much in Rome. You got to read this, guys. I just don't have the time. I wish I had the time. Christianity was growing so much in Rome, right? That he felt threatened. So he said, you know what? Let me become a Christian. Right? And this is what he did. This was in the year 325. Look what he did in the year 326. In 326, after becoming the sole emperor of Rome, he kills his wife and his first son. This is a Christian. According to church historian Philostorgius, he writes the following, Constantine, having obtained rule over the whole Roman Empire he, by remarkable success in wars, ordered his son Crispus to be put to death at the behest of his wife Fausta. Later, he locked his wife Fausta in overheated baths and killed her because his mother, Helena, blamed him for the out excessive grief for her grandson. Do you think a man of God would do something like that? Nope. Absolutely not. Let's keep going into church history. This is from James Worry. Christianity had now become popular, and a large portion of those who embraced it only assumed the name. Now, again, I'm not being disrespectful to anyone, okay? But you ask most of the people that tell you they're Catholic, ask them how many times a year they go to church. Some of them never go to church. They just put the name and the identity of being Catholic. 
Some of those who embraced it only assumed the name. While at heart, they were as much heathens as they were before. All right? Error and corruption now came in upon the church like a flood. So some of the pagan superstitions, as they brought into the church at the time, have been handed down to the present and is still in practice today in many churches. Are you, are you still with me, church? Yes, mm. another, another historian, A.C. Flick says, the mighty Catholic church was a little more than the Roman Empire baptized. It is not a matter of great surprise, he says, therefore, to find that from the first to the fourth century, the church had undergone many changes. And in this period, Thanks to Constantine, thanks to Rome, the infiltration of paganism into the church was represented by the black horse. Felix Schaff says, the, Christian, the Christianizing of the state amounted to a paganizing and secularizing the church. The mass of the Roman Empire was baptized only with water and it smuggled heathen manners and practices into the sanctuary under a new name. Hmm. So here we have the black horse. This period of this black horse, the third seal, is covering the part of history of the church from the time of Constantine beginning around A.D. 323 to the papal supremacy in A.D. 538. Amen? Let's go to the fourth seal. Revelation 6, 7, and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I looked, says John, and behold, a what? A pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death and Hades follow him. And the power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. So the church was united with the state. We've already discussed that, right? The, the Roman emperors supporting the Pope while the heathen continued to, to come into the church, bringing their holy water, their holy garments, uh, bringing their temples and all the tradition of paganism. And in A.D. 538, the Bishop of Rome became the recognized head of the church in all the world. In all the what? In all the world. And those who refused to recognize his authority were persecuted. So the first period, known as the Dark Ages, was ushered in, and the Bishop of Rome rules with a hand of iron. The world was subject to him and the rules over kings and majesties. Anyone, my dear church, anyone that opposed the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, will be tortured into submission. So this period of the pale horse with its rider of death followed by hell or the grave vividly symbolizes those dark days of the Inquisition. This period extended from A.D. 538 to A.D. 1517 when God caused, here God's going to get involved now, right? Because not, God's not about to leave his people alone. Are you with me, church? So when God caused men to begin to oppose the great church and state power which was persecuting the saints of God. So let's go open the fifth seal. This seal is a continuation of the fourth seal. So the fourth seal was open. Everything that happened in the fourth seal is also happening during the period of the fifth seal. You got to understand that, okay, church? Oh, yeah. All right. So it says here in Revelation 6 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who have, be, who have been slain for the world of God and for the testimony which they held. So, during the period of the fourth seal, which is the black, the, the black horse, right? It, it was a horrible persecution of the children of God. Amen? Amen? 
It had been carried out during this time of the fourth seal. And if you go into history, millions of Christians had died. Millions. So the fifth seal is, gives us a view of the marches from the 16th century to the time of the papacy was finally restrained. Mm-mm-mm. The description continues in Revelation 6.10, and it says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood and those who dwell on the earth? So we have a period of persecution, the fourth seal, right? Now in the fifth seal, we have the saints, the men and women of God who have maintained themselves faithful even at the face of death. But now they're so desperate because it's like they have no place to go, but they can go to God, right? So they, they, they call out to the Lord and say, how long? How long, O oh Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So if you notice here under the fifth seal, the very blood of the martyrs cried out to God for revenge. And this is common because if you go to Genesis, um, it tells us that Abel's blood was crying out against his brother. Remember that? So, so, so these martyrs were not in heaven, but under the altar where they had been slain. Their persecutors were not just being punished in hell fire either, or there would not have been a cry for revenge. Hmm. You still with me, church? So, so the death of these millions of martyrs became the means of bringing many who were in paganism to Christ. Remember I shared with you about the, the, Jew, the, 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 Jew, the Jewish, the Hebrew boys in the statue of gold in Nebuchadnezzar, right? It wasn't just so much that they knew who they worship and they could have bowed down to avoid the problem. The, the, the issue is that by their testimony, come on church, by your testimony of valor and courage, you can bring others to Jesus. Amen. So they, they, they did not bow. They stood up, right? And they faced the punishment. But Jesus did not um, liberate them from the punishment. Jesus was with them in the punishment. Are you with me, church? So, so this is what happened here in this time, in this period, while these millions of people were dying, you know, history books says that other people, the people that were, that were given the punishment, they, they were surprised at the courage. They were surprised at, at the fortitude that these men and women were showing, huh? the faith that they had in Christ, that they would rather die than deny their faith. And because of that courage and the testimony, history says that most of them, or some of them, became Christians. Their hearts were touched. Their hearts were touched because they were seeing in their face. It's like a movie. They were seeing the faith of these men and women faithful to God. Matthew 24, 22 says, And unless those days were shortened, mm -mm -mm, and unless those days were shortened. That was applied back then and is also going to apply to us at the end of the world. The persecution was cut short. Because we just read that the saints were calling out to God. How long? How long is going to take, Lord, before you avenge us? That's what, that's what their cry was. So God brought the persecution short. And he instituted the Protestant Reformation. Amen? So, so the very blood of the saints who had died during this terrible time cried out to the Lord to put a stop to the persecution. And I thank God for Martin Luther. How many of y'all thank God for Martin Luther? I do. I do. I thank God for Martin Luther. Because he came to action. He, he could have he got killed. He goes and he nails his thesis on the door of the Catholic Church. Hmm? Rebuting their practices. 
Re rebu rebuking the, their system, rebuking everything that the Catholic Church was doing because the Holy Spirit was using him, because the Christians, the saints, were calling out to God, how long, Lord, how long, holy, will it be before you avenge us? And God lifted up this man called Martin Luther to put the truth in the door of the Catholic Church. I can't wait to see that man in heaven. Oof. And that, my dear church, was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. In the mercy of God, those terrible cruelties were stopped. Other men besides Luther were responsible for the progress of the Reformation. Men who were courageous and faithful, among them were Huss, Wycliffe, Jerome, Tyndale, Ridley, Rogers, Hooper. I know some of you know this story. And many others. Some of these paid with their lives for their faith. Come on, church. Hmm? With their life. Hmm. It was not even safe to travel during nights. It, it, with the fear that they could be killed. But we are so thankful to them. Amen. So thankful to them. So, so the pale horse of the fourth seal during the dark ages from A.D. 538, when the church united with the state to enforce its beliefs on all until A.D. 1517, when the Protestant Reformation began. So the fifth seal with the blood of the martyrs crying out began in A.D. 1517. Again, the fourth and the fifth seal are together combined, okay? And with the advent of Reformation and extended to the opening of the fifth seal in A.D. 1755. Now let's open the sixth seal. Revelation 6, 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal. And behold, there was a great earthquake. A great what? A great earthquake. This great event took place on November 1, 1755. Again, I'm going to explain to you some of the things that happened in the sixth seal, but it's just the basics, okay? If you want to, like I said, I always encourage the church, don't believe what I say. Look at yourself, amen, because there's a lot of information. So, so the first thing that happened was that there was a great earthquake. So the things that happened in this seal were not just things that were common, Okay, I want you to understand that. Because a lot of people say, well, we have earthquakes all the time. Well, you know, we have meteorites coming down from heaven all the time. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we have eclipse, right, that darkened the day for about, what, 15 seconds, right? This is not talking about your common events. This is talking about supernatural. This is talking about events that if you dig into history and you dig into all this, this, this genius people that I call that they study a lot, about the stars and all these things, they're going to say, hey, this is something that's not normal. Amen. There are still people today trying to figure out the things that happen in this seal. Okay? So, so the first thing is the earthquake. In November 1, 1755, the greatest catastrophe that had ever been known since the time of the flood, on that day occurred the great earthquake of Lisbon, Portugal, which not only shook Lisbon, but also much of the earth's surface. Pretty much the entire earth felt that earthquake. Nelson New Looseleaf Encyclopedia describes it under this article. Earthquake, the Lisbon earthquake, which occurred on November 1, 1755, is the most notable earthquake in history. There have been many severe earthquakes in the history of the world, but all agree that this earthquake in 1755 takes first in rank. Just like I said now, it's, it wasn't something coming, because we, we have earthquakes. We just had an earthquake in Puerto Rico not too long ago. Mm. The earth is shaking constantly. Are right, you still with me, church? So, so yes, it was a very large earthquake that have occurred after this, and many there will be bigger ones. But the prophetic time in which it occurred and the following sign that Jesus prophesied and which are also predicted in this time order in the Old Testament. So here's another thing that you have to look at. You have to look at the times of the seal, okay? Because if it happened in the times of the seal, then it is a fulfillment of prophecy. Amen, church? See what happened here. 
something is going on here. Give me a second. Okay, here we go. All right. Sir Charles Lee describes the Lisbon earthquake as follows. A violent shock threw down the greater part of the city. In the course of about how, many, how much time? Six minutes, 60,000 person perish. The sea first retired and lay the bay dry. What's, what's that sign of? Sign of a tsunami, okay? And it rolled in, rising 50 feet or more above its ordinary level. That was a tsunami. Hmm. So let's read about more about this seal in Revelation. This is something else that's coming right after the earthquake. Revelation 6, 12. We're still on, on verse 12. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. So we have the earthquake, right? Now we have the sun becoming black as the sad cloth of hair. So here's another event that was to take place during the sixth seal. Remember, it had to happen on that period to be the fulfillment of the prophecy. We find from history that these events took place just 25 years after the great Lisboa earthquakes. Noah Webster tells us the dark day, May 19, 70, 1780, so called an account of a remarkable darkness on the day extending over all New England. The true cause of this remarkable phenomenon is not known. So, so, so this darkness began about 10 o'clock in the morning and it lasted all day. Some people say, well, it could have been, uh, um, what do you call that? Say it again? An eclipse. It could have been an eclipse. But how long does an eclipse last? Let's say 15 minutes. Let's just say an hour, which is never, is never, it doesn't happen, right? This happened all day. At 10 o'clock in the morning, it was dark. It was dark all throughout the entire day. The world-famous astronomer Herschel has said this. The dark day in Northern America was one of those wonderful phenomena of nature which will always be read with interest but which philosophy as is at a loss to explain. They can't explain it. They cannot explain how the sun goes completely dark, right? But we know what happened, right? Because it's a prophecy and because God said it is going to happen, amen? So the darkness became so great that the farmers left their work in the fields, right? The light, the light became necessary. The cattle went into the barn. The chickens went into the chicken coop. And everybody just went inside the house. All the labor stopped. People that, 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 that witnessed it, that was there, say that they couldn't see their hand in front of their face. That had to be a scary moment. Scientists are still trying to explain this dark day. They cannot say it was an eclipse, for the moon was full and not in the proper position in relation to the sun for an eclipse. The sun, moon, and earth had to be in a direct line in order to produce an eclipse, right? More than that, an eclipse lasts only a short period of time, right? And this darkness lasted the entire rest of the day right after 10 o'clock in the morning. There's something else happening in, in this seal. We're still in, in verse 12. And the moon became like what? Like blood. This happened in the same day. Right after the darkness of the day, right, I think it was right around midnight. After the sun was darkened and when night came, it would be supposed that the moon would appear. But it didn't. Finally, when it did appear about midnight, it was blood red. Are you still, are you still with me, church? It was blood red. Here's what Milo Bostic has to say. The moon, which was at its full, it was a full moon, had the appearance of blood. The alarm that it caused and the frequent talk about it impressed it deeply on my mind. Stones of history of Beverly in Massachusetts. So the moon continued blood red the rest of the night. It wasn't just an event for 10, 15 minutes or an hour. The rest of the night, the moon continued to be blood red. Amen? Something else happened in this seal. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. Even as a fig tree casteth her in untim untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. 
So the stars fall occasionally. And this, they call it the stars, but it was actually a meteor shower, okay? Just so, you, so, you, so, you, so, so for clarification, the Bible says the stars were falling, but it, it was meteor showers. The stars cannot fall, right? If the stars will fall, it would be a catastrophe. So it was a meteor shower. But no doubt, the greatest Exhibit of falling stars occur in November 1833. This is what Charles A. Young had to say, a professor of astronomy at Princeton University. Probably the most remarkable of all the meteor meteoric showers was that of Leonides on November 12, 1833. The number, check this out, this is astonishing, y'all. The number was estimated as high as 2 million an hour for 5 to 6 hours. Can you imagine the spectacle in the sky? Over 2 million meteorites just coming down an hour for four, 5 to 6 hours? The heavens were blazed with falling stars. People thought surely that it was judgment day. So now that we have the great earthquake, what else came out to the, the great earthquake? Come on, y'all. The sun, the sun darkened, right? And right after the sun, the moon turned into what? The moon turned into blood or it was a reddish blood color. And after that, we had the falling stars in the same order as it was prophesied. That's what you got to look at. It's in the same order that it was prophesied, and it's, with, and it's between the period of the seal. Amen? Jesus also prophesied this. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, let me stop right there. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, what happened in the seal before? The saints cried out to God because they were what? In tribulation, right? And he sends, he sends Martin Luther to what? Come on, church, come help me out. He sends Martin Luther to what? To liberate the Christians, right? To stop this tribulation. So Jesus is, 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 is right on track with the prophecy of Revelation. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be what? Darken, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be darkened. This, my dear church, agrees with the prophet John that he had told us in Revelation on the seal. Amen? So, there is still one more event mentioned in the sixth seal. It says, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Can anyone guess real quick what, what is this event? It's the second coming of Jesus. Amen? This is the event that is still in the future, and it will take place in connection with the second coming of Christ. In fact, we are living just now before this event takes place. All right? We are living just before this event takes place. Matthew 24, 29 says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. All the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, hallelujah, of heaven with power and great glory. Amen. That is the day that we are all aiming for. Amen. So these signs have been completed, and we are now waiting for the final event, the second coming of our beloved Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we are living between the falling stars of verse 13 and the heavens rolling back as the scroll. Are you with me, church? All right. The last thing that happened on this prophecy, on this seal, was the falling star. We're not going to have an event as such because that event fell right in where the seal was, the time period. It's important. This is how you can really, you know, learn to, 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 to dissect the prophecies and, and to really, you know, find out 
the, 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 the truthfulness of the prophecies when you go into the time period, right? There's a lot of people, not Adventists, that are trying to interpret these prophecies. And, you know, we have to be careful because, because when I go on Google, right, so I try to, I try to get guys' images, right? Y'all see we got some awesome major images. And a lot of people are really good with these images, right? Um, so when I, when, I, when I go into there, before I use the image, like sometimes they write something on the image, and if I like the image and it represents what the Bible says, I will edit that image. I will take whatever it is off of it because I know the truth. Amen. I know what God has revealed to us, right? So, so you have to be careful because there's a lot of people interpreting these prophecies, right? But they're not. I mean, they're not. Some, some of these prophecies, people are interpreting way in the future. For, I'll give you just one example because we have to continue, right? Some people say that we are still in the days of creation. Did you believe that? There are people today that believe that we are still in the days of creation. We'll leave it at that. Right? So... We are living in between, in, in the area of the falling stars and verse 13. Here's what verse 14 says. Revelation 6. Now in verse 15 says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and in the mountains. So this Surely describes, my dear church, the wicked at the time of Christ's coming. They will run in terror and try to escape from his presence, but they're not going to be able to do so. Calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated at the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great thing of their wrath has come and who can stand? Who can stand? So let's do a, a, a review here. We have completed the sixth seal beginning in 1755 and extending to the second coming of Jesus. Amen. It began with the Lisbon earthquake in 1755. Then we have the darkening of the sun and the moon turned to blood in 1780. And then we have the falling of the stars in 1833. And those are the signs. So, so, so remember, I got to make emphasis. Remember, when you're trying to, 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 to the phrase, the prophecies, make sure that you are in that time period. Amen? So we are now waiting for the fulfillment of the last sign. Amen? The heathens departing as a scroll at the second coming of Jesus to this earth. Now, this is interesting because we're going to go into the seventh seal. If you look at the screen... Between the sixth seal and the seventh seal, we have the sealing of the people of God. We have, um, we have the 144,000, and then we have the great multitude, okay? That chapter talks about, basically, someday we'll talk about the 144,000, because that's a... Um, it's creating a lot of confusion in the church. But we're going to bring it to you with a lot of Bible evidence and details. Amen? But what the 144,000 is saying in the great multitude in that chapter, it is speaking about the sealing of the people of God. The entire chapter is describing God's last work in this world and the preaching of this gospel of his kingdom. This is all transpired between the sixth seal and between the seventh seal. Let's open the seventh seal. And by the way, that is in chapter, in chapter 7. We jump from chapter 6. Now we're going to chapter 8. Amen? Amen? When he opened the seventh seal, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all should all be screaming and yelling, Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. 
Y'all miss your shout. Let me read it again. When he opened the seventh seal, remember, church, before the seventh seal, you got the sixth seal. Between the sixth and the seventh, there is a period when the gospel is preaching itself with power before Jesus comes. It is the period when Jesus is speaking his children, is, is sealing his children. It is the time of the mark of the beast. It is the time when people are going to choose the beast or they're going to choose Jesus. All right, are you with me, church? And, and, and the world is in chaos. And now we come to the seventh seal. And John says that there was a silence in heaven for about half an hour. Can we get a hearty amen? Yes, amen. Y'all not, not understanding it. Y'all just looking at me like I'm crazy here. Do you know what this half hour of silence is? This is the second coming of Christ, y'all. This is Jesus leaving heaven and coming to take us home. Hallelujah. Mm. So let me explain. In a prophetic time, we know that when we count the days uh, for a year, uh, one day equals what? Equals one year. So if we, if we take that, that, that method, a, ha a, 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 a half hour is approximately one week. Okay? Now I got to give you the other explanation because I have to be fair, okay? Others maintain that in scriptures, there is no clear basis for taking a prophetic time period less than a full day because the Bible talks about a day equals what? A year, right? There's nothing that says less than a day. Because of that, they prefer to understand that about half an hour means only a short period of unspecified duration. That's why I put it up there. We, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, we believe that it is a period of about one week. What causes the silence? I just said it. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory. And, and what else? It's up there. And all the holy angels with Him. So when the books are closed, when the angels are given... The, the, the plagues that we talked about, remember? The Bible said yesterday, we talked about that no man can enter into the temple. Meaning that the period of grace is gone. That is it. There's no more intercession. Jesus has finished his work. Whoever is filthy can stay filthy. Whoever is sane can stay sane. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right? So, so now, because you got to tie these prophecies, they're, they're tied together. So now, oh, thank you, Jesus. So now, so now the Bible says in Matthew that the Son of Man comes in his glory. Because Jesus is coming, guess who else is coming? God the Father. Because God the Father is coming, guess who else is coming? God the Holy Spirit. So what do you think the angels are going to do? And all the holy angels. It doesn't say some angels. It doesn't say some are going to stay behind and guard heaven because heaven does not to be guarded. Come on, church all the holy angels, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All heaven will be empty. And most theologians believe it and accept the, 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 the belief of the Seventh-day Adventists because it is what the Bible is saying. At the end of the sixth seal, Jesus and all the angels come to this earth. And during the seventh seal, during the seventh seal, heaven is what? It's empty. There is silence in heaven. For about how long? For about half an hour. For about half an hour. So, we believe but it's about a week, right? But I'll be honest, I'm, give, I'm going to give you what Pastor Perez believes. Okay, I'm going to tell you what I think. I believe that whether it's a week, whether it's on the second belief, where it's a short period of time, 
what I do believe that heaven is not going to be empty forever. <laughs> Are you with me, church? God is coming. He's going to take us home, right? And after he takes us home, heaven is going to be full again. Hallelujah. And this time we're going to be in heaven. We got the Father. We're going to be in heaven. We got the Son. And we're going to be in heaven. We got the Holy Spirit. Y'all need to be rejoicing with me. People, I think I'm crazy, but I'm not crazy. I'm just happy. Huh? Because after half an hour or so, whatever time period that may be, heaven is not going to be empty no more. Don't miss tomorrow night. We're going to talk about the thousand years. That's a little bit something to do with this. So the signs have been nearly fulfilled, my dear church. With the exception of the second coming of Christ. We're all waiting for Jesus to return. I am dying for Jesus to return. I literally pray and cry that Jesus returns. There are no more events of importance under the sixth seal, except the becoming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I put this verse up there because I hope this would never be true for us. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Let's not go that way. Let's not even think about that. Let's keep pushing forward. Amen. Let's keep trusting in the promises of God. He say he will return and he will return. It cannot be long, my dear church. The signs of the times are telling us. <laughs> the saints, the blood of the saints are still screaming to God and to Jesus. Come and take us home. I don't know about you, but I'm eager. I am eager to be with my beloved Jesus. Thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. I want to remind you, we have two more messages. Amen? So tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the thousand year, what we call the millennium. And then Saturday morning, we are going to be talking about the second coming of Christ. Amen? Let's stand in the presence of the Lord so we can pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Father, for the prophecies, Lord, that open our eyes, Lord, and, and give us sort of like a timeline as to when your second coming will be close to us. We ask you, Father, to continue to give us understanding, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you continue to bless us as your children. We ask that you continue to give us the power of your spirit so we can continue to proclaim the gospel. We ask a special blessing for our district, our church here in Amarillo and Lubbock, Lord. We ask a blessing for everyone here tonight and those who have been watching us, Lord, on social media. It's a blessing to see that over 50 people every night watch these messages in YouTube. So we're thankful, Lord, for this instrument that most people use it for evilness, but we are going to use it for your honor and for your glory. I want to ask a special blessing for our audio and video equipment people um, because I know that they, they are coming here every night, Lord, and they're making sure that everything goes out perfectly. And, and I don't say it much to them, but I'm very grateful for them. So I, I want a special prayer for our people who are doing the audio and, and video every single night. And not just this week, but every time we have services, Lord. Thank you for them. As always, Father, depart us from this place, never from your presence. Give us a good and safe ride home and bring us back tomorrow. I'm excited about this last two nights, Lord, because these messages are so, so powerful, Lord. Thank you so much for the light that you give us through your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray, we pray, we honor you, we worship you in the name of Jesus. And everyone can say with me, amen and amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone who's watching us on YouTube. We, we thank you so much for supporting our church, for supporting our channel, and we pray that you can join us tomorrow as well. God bless you. Amen.